Howdy folks. In this video, we're going to be looking at the work of a person named uh, de Broglie, Louis de Broglie, who had some ideas about how to relate um, this idea of wave particle duality in a slightly different way. But the part that is a little bit kind of interesting in all of this is he's not just Louis de Broglie. No, he is Prince Louis de Broglie. Uh, he's, he's from France. He was from an aristocratic, uh, aristocratic uh, family. And uh, he actually did have uh, the title of Duke, I believe it was, but also his family had been granted the title of Prince. So he is really Prince Louis de Broglie. And this factors in somewhat in his earlier sort of years with uh, doing work involving physics. So Louis de Broglie um, comes up with this new idea. And uh, at the time, he was having a little bit of trouble getting traction on this because um, he wasn't always, at least at this earlier days, taken as seriously as a physicist only because he was Prince Louis de Broglie. Isn't it wonderful that he's, you know, playing around with physics? But the idea that he presented was quite dramatically uh, different from the way a lot of people were looking at wave particle duality at the time and, and actually had a lot of benefit for us. Because what he is asking is, um, in all of this stuff that we've been doing, we keep talking about light as a wave, sometimes acting as a particle. That's kind of what photoelectric effect throws at us. But he turns it around and he said, shouldn't the exact opposite also be true? That sometimes what we classically think of as particles, things like electrons and protons and stuff like that, would also act as waves. And his proposal uh, involves a formula that he throws together. Now, what he's doing is taking classical, uh, the, the first part that you can see there is classical momentum, P equals MV and he's combining it with sort of this, this throw-off sort of momentum formula that Einstein had, uh, momentum equals Planck's constant divided by wavelength. And he says, let's just put them together and solve it for lambda. So we get this formula that says lambda equals Planck's constant divided by mass times velocity. Now we do have to be careful about a few things here. Remember that anytime we're dealing with Planck's constant, if we don't have a genuine actual reason why not to, we're always going to use Planck's constant as sort of the standard Planck's constant, not the one with the electron volts and stuff. So we have to make sure that we're using that one. The mass times velocity stuff on the bottom, well, that's where we do have to recognize that if we're going to genuinely say that a particle has a wavelength, uh, it does have to be in motion. It can't just be motionless. Now, some people took this a little bit differently than they should have. Because remember, I said they weren't necessarily being entirely accepting of de Broglie's ideas, at least at first. So they said some kind of ridiculous things, like, oh, and sorry, I forgot that I had those uh, little notes down there about the formula, but they're all just, you know, standard. But um, they said, okay, fine. What if I took something like about a baseball-sized object, something that's about 200 grams, 0 0.200 kilograms, and I throw it at 15 meters per second? Hey, what would its wavelength be? And they took the formula, and they shoved the numbers in, and they got an answer that's 2.21 times 10 to the negative 34 which is ridiculously small. And I mean ridiculously small because um, remember from our way of looking at measuring wavelengths, kind of the, the classic way is let's do, you know, some sort of like a, a single slit, double slit, whatever sort of diffraction experiment. And when we're doing diffraction, the size of the opening or the obstacle that we're going around has to be roughly on the scale of the wavelength we're measuring. Um, there's nothing in the universe that's 10 to the negative 34 meters, big or opening. We, we can't make a diffraction grating that would let us test this. So right there, uh, it, it doesn't allow us to experimentally verify this. But it's also ignoring something else. 
And it kind of shows where uh, we always have to remember that we're doing quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics whole gig is doing stuff at super duper teeny tiny small scales, like electrons being popped off of a, a piece of metal during the photoelectric effect. Is a baseball quantum sized level event? Not even remotely. There is no reason for us to expect a macroscopic real world object to act in a quantum mechanically kind of way. Wave particle duality doesn't apply to everyday sized objects and stuff that's around me right now. It applies to the quantum realm, and that means little teeny tiny stuff. So even asking a question like this is essentially ridiculous. It, it has no meaning. Wave particle duality and quantum mechanics do not apply here. So instead, we got to look at something much smaller. Let's look at something like an electron that goes through a potential difference. We get it accelerated up to some, you know, decently fast speed, and then we talk about its wavelength. And this is very definitely the way that like a diploma wants to present questions like this, because they want to make sure that you're able to take old ideas, like let's use voltage to accelerate a charge between like parallel plates, and then piggyback it with something like quantum stuff. So, you know, they're able to check you on two things. So the first part of this is we'd have to go ahead and do sort of a old, um, you know, parallel plates kind of question where we want to figure out how fast this uh, electron is going to end up moving. We do need its velocity. So I'm going to use uh, kinetic energy, one half mv squared for that. And I'm going to use the idea that we had of um, putting charges through voltages gives them energy. The original formula V equals delta E over Q solved here for just energy. Now remember, if you wanted to, and you know, if, if you want to kind of approach this, if you had other information that's not given here, um, you could do stuff about measure the electric field between the plates, which like I said, we can't do here because we don't know the distance between the plates and fields cause forces, forces cause accelerations. What's the final velocity? But we don't have that information here. So we're going to use this method. We take these two formulas and we squirt them together. And then we just end up solving for the, um, the velocity of the electron. So I've just kind of done my formula manipulation there. I can put in the charge of an electron, because I know that from the data sheet. It's an elementary charge. Uh, the voltage was given to me, 100 volts. And I know the mass of my electron, again, from the data sheet. So I squirrel those numbers into there. Don't forget to take the square root at the end. And I get a speed that's pretty wicked high, but definitely within the realm of what we know electrons can do, about 6 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. Okay, now I switch over and I start doing the quantum mechanics sort of stuff, the de Broglie wavelength stuff. Now, I'm just kind of giving you the formula here shown as given, but remember it's really from taking classic momentum and um, Einstein's formula for momentum and jamming them together and then solving for lambda. I'm going to go ahead and put in regular Planck constant on the top and then divide that by the mass of the electron again and the speed that we just calculated a moment ago. I throw all of that in and I get 1.23 times 10 to the negative 10. Now, what's kind of percolating in my brain here is that that is a very reasonable wavelength to do a measurement of. Because I'm even thinking, um, you know, when we're talking about, uh, you know, things like visible light and into UV and stuff like that, we measure in the nanometers, 10 to the negative 9. 10 to the negative 10 is just outside of that sort of range. So this is a very reasonable sort of number to be uh, trying to set up some sort of an experiment for. This is a number we can experimentally verify. And they did. And by they, I mean these two wonderful fellows named Davison and Germer. So what they did is they took a piece of nickel 
And I mean like actual nickel nickel, not the coin, but the actual metal. And they had a wafer of it. Um, it would have looked kind of like a super thin uh, poker chip to you. That, that'd be about what it looks like. And they had it. And on the other side, they were shooting electrons at it. And the electrons, they you know did have them shoot uh, by um, putting them through a, a set of parallel plates to get them up to speed, just like the question we just did. And they shot them right at the nickel. And you say, so what's the big deal? Why were they using nickel? Because you do have to remember that when we think of metals on the periodic table, um, you know, we think of shiny stuff when we look at it, but metals are a crystal structure. And so that means that they have all of their atoms aligned in these nice, perfect crystal patterns. That means there's gaps between those crystals, between the atoms. For nickel, those gaps are in the range of 10 to the negative 10 meters. So when the electrons go at the nickel, it actually acts like a diffraction grating. It acts as a bunch of open slits for the electrons acting as waves to interact with. So on the other side, you get the pattern that shows in that picture there. And what you're looking at is because of the way electron waves interact with the nickel, instead of getting slits like this that we think of from like uh, Young's double slit experiment, I'm getting these concentric circles, but it's still bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark. It's the same pattern. And I actually did this experiment when I was a student in university. And this pattern appears like on the back side of sort of a, a rounded uh, vacuum tube that you do this all in because you don't want air molecules getting in the way and interfering. But you actually take like a real honest to goodness ruler and you bend it along the outside of that curved tube and you measure the distances between those interference patterns. With that, you can actually then do like a, you know, a, a diffraction question and you can measure the wavelength of the electrons. And guess what? The number comes out like exactly the same as de Broglie's formula predicts. And I mean exactly, like it's, it's spooky. And again, I'm doing this experiment in university with a plastic ruler and I was measuring stuff and I was getting error below 1%. That's how good the results come out. It's, it's actually kind of spooky almost. But what it's showing is that when we are measuring these quantum effects, because there's not a lot of big macroscopic noise in the way, the results end up actually being pretty awesome. Uh, just like Compton doing the Compton effect, same sort of idea. Now, that's all there really is to this. Um, as far as homework goes, the first little chunk is a little bit of stuff involving de Broglie, and then the later stuff is because we are at, you know, pretty much end of chapter sort of stuff here, and it gives you an opportunity to do some, some questions on some other stuff. So good luck with that, and uh, see you later.